I first met sisters Sadie and Bessie Delaney in 1991 when I wrote about them for the New York Times. They're now ages 103 and 101 and live together in a two-story house in Mount Vernon, New York. They are the daughters of a man born into slavery who became America's first elected black Episcopal bishop. Sadie and Bessie themselves were among the first African-American women professionals in New York City. Along with their eight brothers and sisters, all of whom went on to successful careers, they were born and raised on the campus of St. Augustine School in Raleigh, North Carolina, where their parents taught. Together, they recall the triumph and setbacks of a lifetime spent side by side. We had a, a, a happy life. No money at all. No money. Couldn't get your hand on one penny. You didn't have but one thing that you owned in the world, and that was a little cot. Each one of us slept separately. We, your bed was your palace. The home that Mama and Papa made for their ten children was buoyant and comforting. But the sisters also vividly recall memories of lynchings and the beginnings of the Jim Crow era in the 1890s. Every summer, they would take us out to Pullins Park to, to have a picnic. We would always sit in the front of the car because the wind would blow, you know. We didn't have that pay but a nickel then to go. And all of a sudden, one summer, Sunday, we had to sit in the back of the car. And we wanted to know why we couldn't be set up there. So they had, had, had segregation then, so they put us in the back of the car. Uh, uh, colored people a long time ago didn't do anything but work in white in the kitchens for the white people. And my father and mother didn't want that. So after we got our training at St. Augustine, my father said, teach and work, and then go and get a college degree. So you're not, never going to be anything until you get a college degree. After teaching in the rural South for over eight years, by 1925, Sadie had earned her master's degree from Columbia. She became the first African-American in New York to teach domestic science at the high school level, but only after deliberately not appearing for her interview. They always, if there was a colored person on there, just they just skip over there. Don't care how smart you were. And so, I mean, they didn't appear, they didn't know whether I was white or colored. And uh, so they appointed me. And then all I had to do to go to the school was to, to, to accept that point. But I was appointed then. And, and maybe the didn't the they didn't the head dropped in. And that's how I got in. Bessie earned her college tuition after 10 years of teaching, graduated from Columbia School of Dentistry and Oral Surgery in 1923, and became New York's second black woman dentist. Well, I graduated. I was uh, no, There were 11 girls in the class. Nobody wanted to walk with the shine, so I carried the United States flag. I walked by myself. My office was more uh, social. of a social service office. Everybody in the neighborhood, in Harlem, everybody knew Dr. Bessie. Once a patient went out to California and sent me a card, Dr. Dr. Bessie, Bessie New York City. City, that's all. Was I, got to her office. I was known because I never refused to help anybody. It didn't make any difference to me what the color of your skin was. Bessie and Sadie, both successful and fulfilled in their professions in an era when it was almost inconceivable to have both career and family, chose not to marry. After living in Harlem in its heyday and the Bronx when it was still rural, they moved to their present home. Today, they cook, manage their own finances, and keep fit by eating wisely, taking vitamins along with a clove of garlic, drinking only boiled water, and doing an hour of yoga a day. Our lawyer, we were just through making another will, the fourth, and I, she came in and she said, what do you attribute your longevity to? I said, I don't know. I said, we have just lived a good Christian life as far as we know. And uh, I said, she said, I know what it is. I said, have you ever been married? 
I said, no, no, heavens forbid. She said, that's what it is. I said, it <laughs> possibly is. I said, we never had to go through that. And uh, we, she discovered that that was one of the things that kept us from being worried, worried to death. Me. But it is their relationship that seems to sustain them. Each day they talk, laugh, and pray together. Life wouldn't be worth living without each other. We would be lonesome. We have a good time. We have a good time. With this rare memoir, Sadie and Bessie Delaney are now the world's oldest authors with century-old stories to tell. But they wrote the book because, as Mama used to say, if it helps just one person, it's worth doing. I felt that it ought to be done, that maybe we had something to give to the world. And if we did, it, we ought to do it. After a lot of thought, we decided that the best title for this book that we were going to write would be Having Our Say. And believe you me, you I had, had mine. I'm satisfied with what I've said. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we wanted to be a success. We wanted to help other people. But it has served its purpose. And I think it has helped me to want to live again. Thank you.